Major funding for A Taste of Louisiana with John Folks and Company is made possible in part by Zatarain's authentic New Orleans style dinner mixes. Zatarain's, a good way to jazz up dinner and a real New Orleans original since 1889. Hello, I'm Chef John Folks. Food is so much more than nutrition here in the South. Every weekend on Louisiana's Back Roads and Bayous, our festivals celebrate the food, music, and cultures that make us unique. Why not join me as we visit the fairs and festivals of our state and cook up another great taste of Louisiana. What a beautiful morning we experienced riding through Bayou Country on our way to Franklinton, Louisiana in search of the Washington Parish Free Fair. This gorgeous couple is George and Martha Knight, whose cabin was donated to Mile Branch Settlement, home of the Free Fair, in August of 1975. The fair is by far the largest country fair by attendance in the United States. What's even more unique is that Mile Branch Settlement and the fair pay as tribute to the pioneering spirit of these local residents. The fair showcases the rich history of this area and immortalizes the culture that was established here. Here we witness one of the great traditions in Washington Parish, grinding of the yellow corn into meal at the local grist mill. Activities of this type make sure that the customs of yesterday are sure to be preserved here in South Louisiana. Obviously, this fabulous cornmeal is available for sale daily during the fair. Whenever you see the word crackling, rest assured people will line up to purchase this delicacy. In this age of low-fat cooking, one might wonder why anyone would want to purchase fried pork skins. Well, hey, I can answer that question. Great taste. These ladies are sampling a taste of open kettle cane syrup. Sugar cane juice is boiled in these open vat kettles at Stafford's Mill just as it was 200 years ago on a sugar plantation. In my opinion, this produces the best tasting syrup in all of the world. And you know that's true because you see me using it here on the show all the time. All cultures are represented well here, including our Native Americans. One of the most popular booths at the Free Fair is the Indian fry bread. This dough is rolled flat and deep fried. I just love these drizzled with some nice cane syrup. Whenever I visit the fair, my favorite stop is Bankston's General Store. Here one gets a good glimpse into retailing back in the 1890s. Imagine for a minute walking up to this counter and ordering a pound of sharp cheddar cheese cut and served right from this 100-year-old cheese cutter. You know, somehow I think cheese just had to be just a little bit better back then. The center of every small community, whether in South Louisiana or not, was the blacksmith shop. And Bankston's shop dates back to the early 1890s. This business operated into the 20th century, with the building being donated to the settlement in 1980. And if you're a farmer at heart, well, have no fear, there's something here for you too. In fact, you can just step up to a quick class in sheep shearing and hay by hand, of course. If it was done in the past, whether cooking or quilt making, you'll see great examples of it here. The ladies of Mile Branch are very happy to give you a lesson in the art of stitching up one of these gorgeous quilts. Just take a look at that thing. And if you're inclined to sample one of the great beverages of yesteryear, just grab a cup or two of this sassafras tea. It's our original root beer, and it was made by boiling the root of the sassafras tree with a little bit of water and, of course, adding sugar and lemon. The great news is that if you drink a cup or two too many, there's a convenient outhouse right around the corner. Gee, I wonder who said, uh, gone are the good old days. Well, you saw their picture a little bit early, and here's the Knight's Cabin. You can visit it and many other historical buildings and view the activities by coming along with me next October as we enjoy reminiscing down memory lane here at the Washington Parish Free Fair. 
if that doesn't entice you to jump in your automobile and head on down to Franklinton, Louisiana, to take part in the Washington Parish Free Fair, I can't imagine what will. And the great thing about this fair, and very unique, I should say, thing about this fair, is that it's dedicated to preserving a great, great part of all of our history, not only that of South Louisiana or the boot of Louisiana, but what we all hold precious with the past, all the days gone by, all of the great things like grounding cornmeal and watching crackling being cooked, where will kids see it? If we don't do something to preserve the past and let people know where we came from, how will we possibly ever know where we're going? So make sure that you load up the family and come spend a couple days in Franklinton, Louisiana in October when the Washington Parish Free Fair takes place. It's a wonderful event. Now, coming into the kitchen to visit with me just a little bit later, somebody who knows a lot about the fair, somebody who was drawn back to that little community because of her love of that pioneering spirit, Judy Jensen. She's going to come in and talk just a little bit about why she left Louisiana and came back and now is a major part of that uh, attraction, the Washington Parish Free Fair. It's a great festival, one of the best. You have to be there. Now, what about the foods associated with it. When I think of that area of Louisiana, I think of English countryside, Irish settlers. Of course, as is true with every other part of Louisiana, there's seven, eight, nine different cultures that come in and influence those areas at some point in time. But there really is a, a heavy English influence there. So a lot of the foods take on that look, even two to three hundred years later. So on my cutting board here, I have the first dish that I'm going to do for you, and it's a cabbage and bean soup. Certainly the English, as well as the Germans, as well as the Cajuns were great farmers. So cabbage came into our culture, and we see it many different ways. The beans came over with the Cajuns, and uh, red beans white beans go into this soup not only as a flavor but as a thickening agent. The smoked meats, whether it's the ham or the bacon, all of those things were cooked in every smokehouse so naturally they flavored the, uh, the soups as well. And then of course meat. This is uh, ground meat and the good thing about ground meat in this soup is that it can be some of the lesser cuts and that's what ground meat was so it flavored a lot of soups and then fresh tomatoes. Of course in this semi-tropical climate of ours in Louisiana, all of these things would grow pretty much all year long and were available all year long. In my pot, I've already begun by sauteing some of the ground beef. I want to cook it slowly over this fire with some of that bacon drippings or some of the oil for just a couple of uh, minutes until the ground beef is grain for grain. Of course, pork would have gone into this dish as well because pork was obviously available in all of the farms. I'm going to throw into uh, the pot now, a little onion, celery, bell pepper, all of those traditional flavors, the flavors that everybody had in the big gardens of that area of the state. Onion, celery. I'm going to put some red bell pepper in here. Not a whole lot of spice in that part of Louisiana, but certainly a lot of great vegetable flavorings. Green bell pepper, naturally. This is a kind of a, a volute, not cream added to this, but a white base soup because it's stock and flour. So naturally, you want to put color in this pot. Look how pretty that is. Really nice colors, and mostly coming from the bell peppers. And then a little bit garlic. Not too much, just a little touch. And I'm going to flavor all of this well by stirring it and mixing it and marrying it together in my old black iron pot, which was the preferred cooking instrument, certainly, of Washington Parish in many, many of the developing areas of Louisiana many, many years ago, and of course, still today. So once all of that's in, now I'm going to add a little bit flour. I want to make a velouté, and a velouté is any stock that's thickened with a flour, velvety in French. So I'm going to put a couple tablespoons of flour, not too much because, of course, the beans are also going to thicken this soup. So we don't want it too thick. It's almost like a good vegetable soup, actually. So then I'm going to blend that in just enough to kind of pick up some of that, uh, some of the fat, some of the bacon fat, some of the drippings. Of course, you can make this a little less fat by, drip, by uh, draining all of that fat out of there uh, once the ground beef is cooked. So stir that around a little bit. Now, right next to the skillet here, uh, to the pot, I have a blue stock pot that I'm boiling some whole cabbage, just quartered cabbage. I'm always telling you that stocks are always better than water. And so what I'm doing is taking a, a cabbage 
and boiling it with a little carrots and onions to put a wonderful cabbage flavor in the water. And since this is a cabbage soup, naturally, we want to go ahead and put a good cabbage flavor in right at the beginning. So go ahead and make stocks. Always just a good vegetable stock is so much better than simply adding water to this dish. Start around, blend it in. You can see why we call this a velouté. It gets velvety very quickly. And I'm gonna add just enough stock, additional stock, to make it a soup. I don't want it to be a stew, so I have to add enough stock to really give it that good soup look, the right consistency, the right viscosity. Okay, so once that's in, then what I want to do is to go ahead and add the rest of my ingredients. I want to add the beans, and of course the beans you can today get them canned already. Use white beans, red beans, lima beans. Put a mixture of beans if you want. I'm using the red kidney because again, pretty color in the soup. Go ahead and add that in like this. Stir that around. I'm going to add the smoky bacon or the ham or the cured ham, whatever you want to put. This will give the soup a nice, really nice flavor. And then you want to go ahead and season it with a little salt, a little pepper. Just go ahead and put all of your favorite ingredients in here, your favorite flavorings, a little salt, a little pepper. It's a light soup. This is a velt vegetable soup texture. Go ahead and put a little salt, pepper. You can put some more green onions and parsley, which is going to give it that good look. And you want these beans to cook for about an hour and a half so that all those wonderful flavors come together. In the last 20 minutes of the soup, remember the cabbage flavor is already in there. Go ahead and take a handful of this shredded cabbage, put it right down into the soup just like this, break it in. Now if I didn't use a cabbage stock, I would have to come in and put cabbage in earlier in the soup. But since I'm using a vegetable stock, a cabbage stock, I'll have good cabbage flavor right away. Then, of course, tomatoes with the juice. I'm adding tomatoes, just whole tomatoes, but I've chopped them up a little bit. You can use dice. And you can see by looking at this that it has a wonderful vegetable soup look to it. And that's exactly what it is, a very hearty country soup from the English, from the Spanish, from the French, from the Germans, all who at some point in time went in to the Washington Parish area, into the Franklinton area. I'm going to let this soup sit here and simmer for a little while because I want it to come together and I'm going to serve it up in a bowl just a little later to show you what it looks like. The next dish I want to do for you from that area is a, an interesting, very interesting dish, but so tasty. When I first heard of this recipe, I said, you've got to be kidding, an onion shortcake? Who would ever eat a shortcake made out of onions? But it's absolutely fabulous. I made it, I tested it, and it was so good, it's now a part of my daily repertoire. I love it. Look at this uh, platter here. I have a really nice platter of the different types of onions that we have available to us in Louisiana. Of course, the Bermuda onion. It gives pretty color to any uh, dish it goes into. This is the jumbo yellow onion, very sweet. This is the white onion, and of course, uh, most people just go into the stores and buy the white onion. This is the sweet Vidalia. The sweet Vidalia is probably uh, the onion that gets the most press nowadays, and it, it, it's sweet because of the soil conditions that it grows in in Georgia. And then, of course, the pearl onions. Um, we have the golden pearl, the white pearl, and all of these different onions can go into the soup. Now, of course, I mean into the pie. Of course, I have to make a nice pastry dough, a nice uh, uh, dough to go into the shortcake pan. And this is very simple to make also. You can go into the store and buy it already. You can buy the, uh, the um, dough frozen. But if you like to make it yourself, why don't you use my recipe? It's so simple. You get a food processor, put about a cup and a third of flour, put about a tablespoon of sugar into it, about a quarter pound of butter. Very simple, quarter pound of butter. Start that processor going until it looks like cornmeal, then slowly add about a quarter cup of ice water. And that dough is going to form just beautifully right, right into that. It's going to be gorgeous. And then you just press it into the pan real nicely. So that's uh, uh, some of my onions. But I want to show you this little baby right here. Doesn't this look like a, uh, what is this, a bird of paradise or something? This came out of, Sharon Jesselshack does all of the styling, all the food that you see on the set right here every day, Sharon does for me. She's great. And she always goes out into the garden and digs up these little onions. Now this one right here, I call this onion Polly. 
This is my great, <laughs> this is my little friend. This is Polly right here. I don't have the heart to chop it up and put it in a soup, but well, hey, I'll take it home with me today. Hey, thank you, Sharon, for bringing that, <laughs> bringing that to me today. Okay, now I have all of that done. I want to show you my, how you put this together. You take the onions, the sliced onions, and you, you can combine them. Slice them very thin, put them in a skillet, again, with a little bacon fat or butter. Saute them until they wilt, until they wilted all the way down, and then take them out and let them cool. If they're not wilted or if they're hot, they'll break the pastry dough, so you don't want that to happen. Then you have to make your custard. This is a custard pie. So in my bowl here, I have a little sour cream. You see that? I'm whipping up just a little sour cream, and then I'm going to add some eggs to it. This is kind of a quiche. I call it a shortcake, uh, and it is a shortcake in, uh, in ways, but... If I was to name this uh, just from experience, I would say a wonderful quiche is what this is all about. So I'll go ahead and whip all of that around. I'm going to put some bacon into it, some nice bacon right there, some chives. Throw some chives down into it. A little cream if you want to thin it out a little bit, about oh, somewhere in the neighborhood of about a half a cup of cream. Whisk all of that around, and then for color, naturally, I'm going to put more of my red bell peppers, my golden bell peppers. Heat it up a little bit with a little drop or two of hot sauce. You can put some Worcestershire sauce, but go ahead and season it. Salt, pepper, basil, thyme, however you would like it. And then once your custard is all whipped up, the eggs will hold it together. I want to show you what the pie looks like. I've taken that dough and pressed it into a three inch spring farm pan. You see what that looks like. And now I'm going to pour the custard right on top of it. Look at that right on top of the onions. Gee, does that look good? It's going to go into an oven at about 425 degrees for about, oh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 minutes just to set that custard and then turn it down to 350 for somewhere in the neighborhood of about 45 minutes to an hour, depending on how it sets. Every oven's different. And look at what it looks like when it's all said and done. I have a pan of it sitting right here. It's really beautiful. And then you can decorate it with all these different a little pieces of chive and all of that. It's really a nice, nice uh, pie. It looks great, and I'll tell you what, it's as tasty as it looks. A wonderful, wonderful dish. Boy, I tell you, my soup is really cooking here on high gear. A couple other things that I found as I was walking through the Washington Parish Free Fair. First, this nice chicken and wine casserole with some onions again, some little spring onions. Very simple flavors, cooked almost like a cook of vin. Very, very nice chicken and wine dish. And then, right here, a raisin pie. The raisin pie that you see right here is William and Mary McGee's pie. And just about everybody in that area uh, came from that, those two wonderful people. And we're going to talk about that just a little bit later. Okay, I told you about my great friend coming into the kitchen, Judy Jensen, who knows a lot about that Washington Parish Free Fair. Hey, how Hi, you doing? John. Nice boy. I love this uh, top you have Thank on you. there. Thank you. This is my great? Nile Branch outfit. Oh, boy, that's wonderful. Beautiful. What Thank do you, you have here? Well, I have some wonderful things from Washington Parish Fair that I brought you that you can purchase at the fair if you happen to go. Cornmeal that you saw ground. Yeah, uh, this was ground. being ground, right? Cane syrup, pure uh -huh. cane syrup that we make there. The Fair Catalog, a wonderful cookbook. I thought you might oh, be interested yeah. in a cookbook. <laughs> I am, I am. And something that uh, I don't ever see you use, and I don't know how to use, nuts from Washington Parish. Yeah, these are the black walnuts, and boy, talk, talk about hard to break into. And the hickory nut, wonderful flavor, but at the same time, very hard to... Uh, uh, to work with. You have to kind of break them with a mallet. Thanks so much for You're all welcome. of these wonderful, uh, wonderful things here. I appreciate it. I want you to take a look at my soup. Doesn't this look good? I'm going to dish some of it up. Take a look at that. I'm going to stir that around for a second. Let me get this ladle here, and then we're going to go ahead and spoon it up. Looks like a great vegetable soup, doesn't That's it? That's beautiful. Really nice. And look how pretty that is. It cooks, once it cooks, assuming that this would have cooked here for about two hours, you can imagine the fabulous flavor in this pot. Just a wonderful pot of soup. And I'm going to go ahead and garnish it. You can put it right down okay. on the board right there. And we're going to go ahead and put a little bit more of this nice orange and red and all of those pretty colors on top of it. And it's a wonderful hearty soup, especially in the early days of Louisiana on those cold winter nights. What better soup than this, huh? Wonderful. You know, one of the things that I found in one of your cookbooks when I was there was this great scripture cake. And I know you've done it before. We've Very talked neat. about it. Let's show everybody how to make it. Every one of these ingredients are listed somewhere in the books of the Bible. I already have a little 
butter and sugar in a bowl, uh, and it's creamed really, really nice. And butter and sugar comes from the book of Judges and Jeremiah. And we're going to go ahead and whisk into that egg. So go ahead and four eggs. This comes from the book of Isaiah. You want to go ahead and whisk that in a little bit and just break that up. Now I'm going to put the uh, pecans and the raisins and the figs in here, and that comes from the book of Samuel. I'm going to just go ahead and put those in. The book of Samuel, just keep whisking that around, and then of course the ginger and the cloves that I put in there as well came from the book of Kings. And now I'm going to add a little bit flour also from the book of Kings, and I'm going to dust a little bit in there with water, just kind of alternate it. I think you have the general idea here. And then I'm going to put in honey, because honey comes from the book of Exodus. And we want to add a little bit, just keep whisking that around until it stirs real nice. And you can imagine how flavorful that cake is going to be. It's, you put it in a loaf pan and you bake it at about 350 degrees or so for about an hour. And this is what it looks like right here when it's all said and done. Why don't you have a seat right there? Take a look at that pretty cake. It's almost like a wonderful, uh, oh, I don't know, I guess I would call it a uh, um, kind of a, a coffee cake or something. It's really, really nice. Well, Judy, thank you so much for coming. And tell me, where is Franklinton, Louisiana, anyway? Well, Franklinton is in the southeast corner of Louisiana. It's in Washington Parish. We're the parish seat. And we're not Franklin. We're Franklin Franklinton. We're often confused. Does everybody uh, uh, think that you're Franklin, uh, Franklin, Louisiana, instead of Franklin? Danielson? Particularly since the new governor. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but no, we're Franklin Franklinton. What, um, uh, what called you back? You, you left Louisiana about 20 years ago, went to Livermore, California, raised a family, and then came back home at some point in time. What drove you back to Louisiana? Well, you know, you can take the girl out of the South, but you can't take the South out of the girl. And it called me back. California's nice, but <clears throat> home is home. I have roots in Washington Parish, generations, and uh, I missed it. Now, we talk about the Washington Parish free fair, but nothing in life is free. I mean, what, what, <laughs> what, what makes yours free? The fair is free. There's no charge to get in. You can go to the fair in the morning. You can sit at the stage, and you can watch entertainment until 10 o'clock at night, free. You don't have to spend a dime. We have volunteers. I mean, we put this on because people in Washington Parish love the fair and they want it to be on, and they volunteer their time year round. Who volunteers? I mean, it must take hundreds of people to make that, that fair happen. It takes thousands, and people like me, people who love the fair and grew up there and want to see it continue and to be free. Because you all put about 65, 70,000 people a day through a that day, fair, right? A day. Why don't you ask them all, hey, would you throw 50 cents into the pot? <laughs> well, we sell fair memberships for a dollar, and oh, we certainly no. hope that everyone who comes through buys a few memberships and they can win free prizes. What, what makes your fair different? I mean, I, I'm sure it has a lot of the same components of most uh, fairs, but what, what sets it apart? Well, Mile Branch sets it apart, for one thing, our, our Mile Branch village. It's, it's family. It's homecoming. People come home to the fair every October. It's a homecoming. You see people you haven't seen in a long time. People meet at certain places. It's a homecoming. The thing that I like most about it, and I mentioned it just a, a little earlier, I think that very few fairs and festivals around the United States, not only here, really spend the time necessary to connect the present generation to the past. And if there's one thing that really sets you apart is the fact that you can go there and walk that midway and see things that, I mean, you're actually taking a step into the past 100 years ago, aren't you? You are. And Mile Branch is a perfect example of Washington Parish in the 1800s. And you can come there and you can see the simple life where the family lived in one room. They didn't, everybody didn't have their own bedroom. So you can see how families grew up and were close. Now, now what about those buildings you have? All these different cabins out there, all of them are authentic. Definitely. They're all from the, from the 17th, 18th, uh, 100. Where did they come from? They came from the families. Uh, the first one was found inside an old house. They tore down the house, and there was the log cabin. So they gave it to the fairgrounds, and then somebody else had one. And it just continued. The families gave them, and the settlement was named, and it's just fabulous. Now you mentioned that, uh, that uh, Franklinton has about 4,000 people. You bring in 65,000 in there. What, what's, uh, what's the town think about that many, uh, that many people coming in? Uh, the town loves it. We have a huge parade on Wednesday morning to kick off the fair with a grand marshal, and you never know who that might be, right. John. <laughs> and <laughs> <clears throat> so the big parade goes through town, and all the businesses close. The school is cl Washington Parish schools are closed during the fair. That's well, I, well, I tell you, I really love uh, uh, walking through those buildings. I, 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 I'm 
a nut anywhere about the history and the past. And I walk through those buildings and you're actually looking at the pictures of the people who lived there so many years ago. You're watching the ongoing displays of, of work and of labors of love, as you mentioned, right. making that syrup happening all around you. you. I'm sure a lot of people would want to say, whoa, I have to go back home and grab grandma and grandpa and I got to bring the nephews. And I'm sure a lot of that goes on where people get so excited about it, they come back time and again. They do. And we, we, we show school kids through all the time. Yeah, well, great. Well, uh, y'all ought to open that thing to the public annually. Well, yeah. guess what? We're planning to have a grand opening September 7th of this year, and we hope to open it to the public on Saturdays and make it available yeah, to everyone. Great. Well, give me a call. I might be I'll there. Thank you so much for thank stopping you. by and visiting with us, and thank all of you for coming in as we continue to cook up more great taste of Louisiana and visit fairs and festivals. See a little bit of this. Scripture. <laughs> Major funding for A Taste of Louisiana with John Folks and Company is made possible in part by Zatarain's authentic New Orleans style dinner mixes. Zatarain's, a good way to jazz up dinner and a real New Orleans original since 1889. This is PBS. The companion cookbook to A Taste of Louisiana is available for $19.95. Chef John Fultz's Louisiana Sampler features recipes and history behind Louisiana's fairs and festivals. The cookbook contains 130 recipes, including those from this show, and over 26 full-color photographs. To order, call 1-800-973-7246 or write to the address on your screen.